uh, this afternoon on the number 067 double nine double four five four six zero six seven double nine double four five four six this uh, is the sit down session that we are having here uh, on midday talk with the Luzuru, where we invite people like yourself to come and tell us what they've been up to their stories what their life what they're doing the business the ministry it differs from day to day and it's always interesting to hear and get to know people's stories from them from them because most of the time other people tell other people's stories but here what we do is to give people an opportunity to come and tell us their stories by themselves so you can get in the conversation by sending us a text on Fantastic. This afternoon, uh, we are joined by saying me, we, I mean myself and you as the listener, we are joined by the General Secretary of NTEU, uh, the National Tertiary Education Union, a staff trade union organization in higher education across South Africa. NTEU's membership, I'm not sure if it's in Teu or NTEU. In Teu, it's fine, yeah. Yes, Teu's membership is made up of lecturing and support staff spread across uh, 18 universities across South Africa. Uh, so the person is also on the managing committee of NEC NEC of FEDUSA, the largest non-politically aligned trade union federation in South Africa. He serves on the ministerial task team for COVID-19 in higher education, very interesting, <laughs> which guides Minister Blade and Zimande on how the sector should respond to the pandemic. So if you have any question, maybe you're a student and you are uh, want to find out how they are dealing with the pandemic, you can send your questions through on our WhatsApp number. Let me give it to you one more time. Maybe you missed it. The WhatsApp number is 067 Double nine double four five four six zero six seven double nine double four five four six. If you are outside of South Africa, it will then be plus two seven six seven double nine double four five four six. Who am I talking about? We are joined by Grant Abbott here on Agape FM. Welcome on Agape FM, sir. Good uh, afternoon to you, Luzuko, and to your team and to the listeners. It's an honor to be here, and thank you very much for the invite. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for making time to come and join us in such a difficult time like this. Uh, you are the Secretary General of the Yeah, General honest. Secretary. Yes, oh. General Secretary. What did, well, I said Secretary General. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Political parties have Secretary General. Trade unions have General Secretary. Awesome. We thank like you. to make the difference. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for clarity. But you you did something different you studied it i did i was working in it for 15 years at nmu uh, nelson mandela university um, uh, and then about five five and a half years ago now i uh, jumped career to this um, so uh, yeah, that's quite an interesting uh, transition. I suppose you, I suppose by the look on your face, you tell you you're wanting to know how I made yes, that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> interesting. <yeah. laughs> so um, NMU has a branch of Nteu at it, um, and I started getting involved. It's it's a voluntary organisation, and um, uh, you you can get elected into the into the local leadership where they deal with local issues at the university. Yes. So I started getting involved in that. Um, found it to be extremely interesting. Um, and uh, uh, then I thought, you know what? Um, I don't know. It, it became such. It became something that was so interesting to me that I thought, well, let me go and see if 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 this sort of semi political structure could be something that 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 could be uh, a career shift to me, to me. so um i then i then part-time uh, started studying through unisa uh, government administration and development to get myself in a in a political mindset 
yes. um, and then applied for the job, uh, which was advertised for the General Secretary of Interior in um, 2014. Mm. And then I was a successful candidate, got it in 2015, chatted to a couple of friends, family, most of them thought I was crazy. Yes. But um, <laughs> I thought, uh, I'm going to take the leap and uh, then see where this goes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, yeah, it was great. I had my family behind me, had some very good um, uh, other, other support structures that just said, you know, go for it. Um, you, uh, you young, well, okay, at the time I was young. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, and then I suppose the rest is history, as they mm. say. So, um, yeah, but uh, I know you're, you're a Christian radio station, so maybe this might, uh, uh, some, some info there that might help with it is that we did a series in our church at the time called Can a Nation Be Changed? Mm. So, um, something of that uh, uh, gripped my heart, and I thought, well, you know what, um, I don't know exactly, there's, there's never any certainty as in, as in un, un, unless God comes and writes on a wall or sends you a WhatsApp, yeah. you're never going to be certain that it's definitely, you know, what, what he's saying. So I thought, well, it, said, it feels right to me. I've spoken to a few other people who felt, said it felt right. I thought, well, let me see. Whatever doors open, I'll walk through them and let's see how far this thing it's goes. It's going to take, yeah. Um, and that's... Uh, how it's been. <laughs> That's how it came. Yes. How have your Christian ethos informed your decision making in various situations as a leader? You. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it specifically to, let's say, the last year. Because mm. the last year has been the, 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 the craziest uh, yes. time ever and there's decisions that you never thought that you would ever have to have to serve with. Um, for me, it's you're working in a team all the time with other people. Um, and in, in the uh, sector, we, we influence and we get, to, we get to influence certain decisions. Um, and, and I think one of the, one of the principles that, that, that I like to try and keep at the top of my mind, I don't always get it right, but is that there, there, there are other people with their stories as well. Um, and they have their, their uh, concerns and considerations. And as much as I'm, I'm anxious about what's going on and I'm anxious about the decisions that are being taken and yes. I'm anxious about what we need to do, I know that there are 10, 20, 30 other people in the room who might be feeling exactly the same, same. as I am, if not more so. So when, when, when I try and engage, I try and engage from a position of compassion, from a position of kindness, and a position of understanding. So that um, uh, there's an end goal, and the end goal doesn't have to, the road to the end goal doesn't have to be, antag doesn't have to be antagonistic or aggressive. Um, sometimes it's necessary, but it shouldn't be the default. So you engage with people, and you try and listen to what's going on, uh, you get the advice from as best uh, people as you can, and you make the decision with integrity so that you can sleep well at night. Yes. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, I suppose that's um, first and foremost in, in how I would I look at it. But very often it's um, you faced with with no good decision. You faced with two bad decisions or three bad decisions, and you've got to choose which one is the worst. Is the least worst of those. <laughs> um, and uh, I was even saying to John before we, we got here that um, we, uh, some of what we're facing now is far beyond the wisdom of Solomon. It's um, uh, none of us alive on earth today know what and have ever faced this before. Um, so we're in a completely different time. So we must be uh, patient and understanding with each other because. While at the end of the day, the minister and the president are making the decision, they are in the same position as I am. They've never lived through it. Yes. Um, so they don't have the experience. That's true. But <laughs> we're even talking at home about the president where he was addressing the nation and we're like, what a difficult time to be in that position. Yeah. He's being tested from every side. Yes. Uh, and for you, because you are a leader uh, and 
theater sometimes it looks amazing and glamorous and it, the behind the scene work is is tough and it's hard as you did mention earlier mm. on but i want to find out from you uh, what does it mean to be a leader what does leadership mean to you um yeah the behind the scenes work definitely you know when, like on the ministerial task team, you're representing a constituency. So I'm representing Nteu, and I represent, to a larger degree, um, uh, Fedusa. Fedusa yes. And so what you do is you take, uh, uh, when, when a meeting is coming up, it's, it's never good for a leader to simply enter a meeting with his own ideas alone. You've got to know what, what your people are thinking. You've got to know what, what, what the constituency that you're representing is thinking. Mm -hmm. So via WhatsApp, I'll put out a lot of questions for input and saying, this is what's coming up. Uh, what's your views on it? Uh, emails, set up meetings. So there's meetings about meetings mm -hmm. um, that goes on. And you take all of that information on board and you listen to everything and then you try and condense it into, because when you get to your time in the meeting, while the meeting might be four hours long, you end up having a total of about 15 minutes to speak. Yes. Um, and so you, so, 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 uh, you know, you kind of, you kind of try and take all of that on board. Um, and with the constituency that big, you can imagine the views are incredibly diverse. Yeah. Um, and you have to try and find the middle ground. You're never going to please everybody. Yes. You've got to just try and see and represent people as well as what you can. You take the common ground and you build from there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, consultative leadership style is, is a lot, um, it's probably more in my, in my own um, uh, makeup, my DNA. I like to consult and listen to what people have to say before taking things forward. It is never good to make decisions on behalf of people and you've never even heard what they've said. What they have to say. Um, that's so never that's never great. Yeah. Um, and so it's yeah. true because <laughs> you're like, but you're dealing with us, and you never come to us to try and find out what's happening, what we are feeling, yes. and what we are thinking. Yes. And, and that's like bossing people around. <laughs> yeah. So, but Tayo has a very good um, uh, grassroots branch structure, mm. uh, where the eighteen universities has leadership, and I'll consult with all of them, and all of them will come together, and I'll hear. You know, what's happening in Limpopo uh, University, what's happening at, at Forte, what's happening at Walter Sisulu, what's happening at UJ, what's happening at TUT, NMU, uh, CPUT, Rhodes University. All of these, and all of these have different, completely different contexts. I was going to... There's not a single, there, there, there's very few that are the same. So one size fits all doesn't work. Mm. So you've got to listen to, to all of these and say, yes, that's a great idea, you know, when the meeting comes and say, yes, we could do that. But... Why would we want to do that when we have um, this university in, in a rural setting with very poor health facilities in the community? Is it a good idea to be bringing back students to campus? Because what happens if there's an outbreak? There's in fact no facilities available there. Whereas it's different for an NMU who could, because the, faci the, the supporting facilities is, so you can't work on a, on a one size fits all. Yeah. Um, and it's good that you listen to those and bring all of those into the yeah into yeah. the context consideration when you're yeah. making a decision. Uh, speaking about like having to deal with them differently, uh, what have been some of your most stretching and difficult, challenging at times and scenarios as a leader? Of this it has to be 2020, I assume. Yes, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, definitely the most. Um, uh, craziest time we never thought uh, that we would be holding all our meetings online mm. um, I've not seen some of our people in over a year and a half because um, our, our standard practice is to have all the all the branch leadership together at least twice a year in a particular venue and we will and we will hold that meeting the whole day long you get to see you get to interact you get to have the tea and the biscuits and the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very different now, and uh, we had to learn very quickly and and uh, how to do this 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 Adapt. online thing. Um, uh, that's been extremely extremely challenging. Um, 
and sometimes you need to then hold a meeting afterwards because people couldn't connect, so you have to uh, uh, connect in, in with them as well. So, um, yeah, definitely this has been the most challenging. Your IT skills, did, think? did they come in handy, sorry? I think they did. They did um, very, very well. <laughs> I think they did. Mm. I, I was, when I was at NMU, um, I was the back-end guy for, for email and communication. And so um, things like Microsoft Teams, which back then was still called Microsoft Link, I was, I was very much the responsible guy for rolling that system out. Mm. So I was like, okay, very cool. I know how to do use, use Teams. We've got the license as to you. We're going to... So, so, so that helped me very much. So, um, yeah. So, so uh, that was definitely a blessing in disguise. Mm. Um. Yes, awesome. And you also let me just remind the listeners at home: uh, if you're listening and you have a question that you want to ask, he is the general, general secretary <laughs> of Ndeu and is also part of Fedusa. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, send it through on our WhatsApp number 067-9944-546. 067-9944-546. Also, you can go to our Facebook page. We are alive there. You can type your question and then we'll read it uh, so that uh, Mr. Grant can answer your question. In your own opinion now, describe the current tertiary education standards as compared to more developed countries and what could be done to radically improve them? Uh, great question. Um, I think maybe what we should do is just, is just maybe take a step back and um, I want to say this with, with, without, and this is my opinion, without mm. necessarily having the, the, the full scientific background, but something of, of what, I've, what I've picked up and what I've known. Um, mm. In, in particularly the last year, is that there is sometimes this misnomer that um, uh, developed countries or so-called first world countries have a better system. Mm. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think um, we have a system that, that is developing and that is, th th there's a historic disadvantage to a lot of our um, uh, of our, our education system, system. Uh, in particular uh, higher education, but I mean basic education as well. Um, I don't think it's always that we would look there and say that's the best way to do it in, like say, the States or the mm -hmm. UK. Um, because what, what you find there, for example, is a very different um, context I know, for example, that, that in the States, in some of the, you know, what would be considered your, your, your really top universities, a student can get in there and qualify from there, but end up paying for their student fees for longer than it would be to pay off a house. Mm. Um, and so the, 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 the cost is incredibly high and the burden then on that person. That's why very often you will hear... In these first, in these first world developed countries, yes. people sometimes hold two or three jobs, yeah. just to make ends meet. And one of those jobs is just so that they can pay the their education. Mm. So there's someone who's qualified as a doctor, but or has a doctorate in something, but is waiting on tables so that they can pay sure. for 20 years for the degree that they got as a they doctor. Got, yeah. So um, those those are those are very different nuances mm. to what to what we have. Um, and I think we are sitting in, in South Africa in, I suppose it is a transition stage. Um, we are definitely not looking at a scenario where um, it's all good. We, we have significant challenges with online, for example. Mm. Now, that's the difference that you would find in, in, in your, your, your well-developed countries, is that there is network coverage virtually everywhere. So everyone is connected to the internet. We don't have that yet. Um, and so uh, getting a electronic device to a student and then data access is in fact two separate uh, uh, concerns altogether. Because mm. you could get a student with a mobile device, but there's absolutely no network coverage, so that thing is virtually um, um, 
impossible to use. So, so, the, yeah. so the student needs to then find an internet cafe or, or move somewhere where he Go can get, get get his his um, uh, uh, lectures and stuff. Yeah, mm. and then there's you know so so what we talk about in in higher education yeah is what we call multimodal. So there's there's different methods. There's for online, mm. um, and then there's let's say offline. So your material is printed and it's couriered to, to you, where you are. Um, to, to where you are to learn from it. Um, but the, the very idea of distance learning and apart from lectures learning is not something for everybody. Yeah. Um, otherwise, if, if correspondence was, was something, then everyone would have just enrolled in UNISA. Yes. Um, that's, not the, that's not the case. So um, I think there are some things we can learn. I think uh, we probably have, as a country, fallen behind in terms of our infrastructure and our ability to have the entire country connected. Um, interestingly, the United Nations uh, a number of years ago declared internet access as, as a basic human right. Um, so that is something that must be escalated. Uh, and so that is happening in terms of the rollout. But um, yeah, we there's a lot more that we can do, and we can look at countries like that. But I think we should look at other at other countries that are that are developing, yeah. that perhaps are maybe a little bit further than us along the line. Don't yes. look at the guys at, at the developed as the target. Yes. Let's look at the guys who are just a little bit down the line. Let's see what they've done. You know, um, uh, Turkey and. We, we have, as I tell you, international re relationships with a number of international trade unions okay. uh, who are in education. So you listen a little bit to what they, to what they did. Um, and see. And then, yeah, and then you, then you call the play. <laughs> <laughs> How it works. Thank you so much for answering the question. We have a question from Facebook from Beverly Erickson. Uh, he says that, hello, Grant. Uh, do you think that our new work from home strategy currently in play will have an effect on how we work in the future? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Beverly. Um, uh, I think it definitely will. I think that uh, the idea that this, 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 this is probably my own personal view, but I don't think there's a going back. To, to something that we considered normal, normal. pre-2020. I think what 2020 and 2021 is going to do to us, it's going to fast track us through the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I think remote, remote working and remote communication is going to become um, more of a norm, yes. so to speak. Uh, so definitely, uh, I think it will. Um, I don't think it is the scenario for all for, for, for every situation in in higher education in particular education in particular. In co there's, there is a, a strong value in in contact education and in contact teaching and learning because different people have have different um, ways of makes, grasping. Yeah, and understanding. You know, mm. I will learn better listening to someone explain it and have the opportunity to there ask for clarity. As opposed to read through something and think, no, I don't know what this is. Doesn't make sense. Um, so, so, so you know, I think it's going to continue to play a part. I don't think we're going to go back to what we thought was normal pre twenty twenty. Uh, I think at the end of this, we'll merge with something that looks like a hybrid mm. between between the two. But then I was going to ask now because he was asking for work. I was going to ask for students now. In the future, you will have the right to choose if you want to attend or if you want to do it online, do you think that's possible? I think it would be. Uh, it definitely would be possible. It, it's, it's almost as though um, we're kind of morphing into that kind of right now. The reality, though, would be uh, the circumstances and the resources of the institution that you're enrolling. Mm -hmm. um, I know, for example, some institutions, for them to go uh, online, their infrastructure needs to change, their IT infrastructure. Yes. And that it costs up to 300 million rand to amend that infrastructure just for one university. Mm. Um, so there are, those, there are those things. So where you enroll is going to be very important. Um, 
and choosing would be, you know, uh, I think I think that definitely is 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 an option. But where you go to will be. We might find unintentionally some institutions morphing into specialisations. Mm. Um, again, that's my own fault. <laughs> uh, but yes. yeah. Awesome. We also have another question from Ulungi. Lungelisa Mabalo Harmanis. She says that, Good afternoon, gentlemen. My apologies in advance. Uh, in case. In case my question has been dealt with already. I would like to check what is, what is it that the union is doing currently? Uh, to, what is the union doing currently to PPEs at schools in our province? And with the, ta with the tablets, Eastern Cape, uh, of education scandals, tablets, Eastern Cape Department of Education scandals. I'm not sure if the question is clear enough. Um, yeah, I, th I, I have a, I have an idea what I think they're asking about, but um, it's outside of my scope. And mm -hmm. TU isn't isn't involved in, in in school level. We are only at, at university <laughs> higher education level. I think that that issue is related to the um, uh, to basic education. Uh, I don't know if she if she would have the opportunity during the show to clarify, but um, uh, there, there I I know that there are uh, political parties taking that matter up um, in terms of of the, the the overspending on PPEs and that sort of thing. Mm. In higher education, what we've what we've done, if I can speak just to that, in terms of each institution, one of the things that came out of the ministerial task team is that took the decision that each institution had to have its own uh, institutional COVID-19 response uh, task team. Okay. okay. And on, on that, all the, all the stakeholders, the student organizations and the trade unions were represented there. Mm -hmm. So of the, at the 18 universities, my, my, my branches um, of NTU has a member represented there. So the PPEs come through there. Um, but the, the, uh, there's gazettes, uh, government gazettes, uh, that, that, that um, have been directed in terms of what needs to happen. Yes. So all, all, um, everybody who enters campuses have to have, you know, PPEs. They have to have um, masks on. Um, staff in particular had to be issued two masks by the the university um, if they were required to come onto campus. Um, that was one of the directives. So. Um, yeah, in terms of, of, of that particular question, I don't think I've, I've answered it exactly because it's it's in the out of your yeah school. it's in the it's in the DBE space the Department of Basic Education yes. um, but I know that political parties the DA in particular has been taking that up. Awesome. Uh, also, one thing I also wanted to find out because basic education, I'm not sure if they lowered the for Mr. Grade Twelves mm. in terms of their exams and stuff like that. It was not as hectic. Do you think tertiary institutions are going to make it easier for them to all be able to go and further their education? Um, I think right now the immediate concern is if there's going to be de a delay in the releasing of what those results will even be. Yeah. Because um, there is already, uh, by now the matric results will have been out of all circumstances. Um, and those are required for registration. So it can have a knock-on effect if it's going to be delayed uh, past the mid of Feb February. Um, we're going to we're going to have um, uh, an even greater problem there. The the immediate concern right now is finishing academic year 2020, mm. and that is uh, uh, a huge significance because we cannot have a scenario where where a university goes through this year without even completing its previous. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, it'll be. A big concern is the dropout rate that could exist, um, and that is 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 very concerning to us. Um, awesome, thank you so much, Grant. Uh, what impact has Ntewo and Fedusa had on university operations, both locally and nationally? Um, so, I think our our involvement in the uh, ministerial task team is is important as an influencer. Um, and and bringing certain things to the table to influence those discussions, uh, particularly from a, a role of, inf of of 
not enforcing, but um, you know, uh, ensuring that there is accountability. Yes. So one of the things, unfortunately, in South Africa, what we have is is deep-seated corruption in a, in a lot of things, and we saw that already in this whole um, uh, COVID nineteen yes. lockdown thing. You know, it's just an, it's just an absolute mess. So so uh, we got out. One of the things for insisting that, that unions are on the COVID-19 task teams at institutions, mm. that is one of the things to look at, is to make sure that, that there's no funny business that goes on there. Um, and then uh, at the same time, we've, we have a campaign running as a, uh, produced as a part of what is called the Orange Mars campaign. This is also talking about, about corruption. Gosh, and it's, yeah. it's on a much bigger scale. So the Orange Mars campaign is every Friday, you wear an orange mask, and I'm sorry I didn't actually bring one. Um, but we were issuing them to to our members that requested, and on Friday they will wear these these orange masks that say no to corruption, and it's part of the Ahmed Katrada Foundation initiative. Mm. Uh, they came up with it is to is to highlight and to and to push this thing of 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 um, you know corruption is the second pandemic. That, that 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 we have in this country. With. Yeah. Mm. So, um, in fact, it's the third pandemic. The 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 first one, COVID nineteen. The second one, gender based violence. Yeah. Mm. It's been on the increase during this time. Mm. Yes. It's been on the increase in our residences. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, Fiducia is one hundred percent behind um, um, pushing government to ratify a convention from the. Mm from the International Labour Organization called C-190. It's a convention that brings um, uh, a stronger uh, emphasis on rooting out gender-based violence eradicate. in the workplace. <laughs> eradicate. <laughs> yeah, eradicate. <laughs> but corruption is a pandemic in this country. Um, and we have to, at every level, make sure that that is... is Being dealt with. Dealt with and it's yeah. carried out. Yeah. So that's the... Um, that's a lot of the, the, the stuff that we, and there's there's other edu higher education unions in Fiducia who also support. So it's not just tell you there's, yes. there's others as well. And um, together it will, will make a very good committee and a very good team, because with all of these others we actually then cover the entire sector um, of higher education. Um, so yeah, it's. <laughs> awesome. One more question before I let you go. Uh -huh. Do you think it's going to get better in your own for universities? <laughs> yes. Yes, I think so. Yes. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because there is always hope. Mm. There, uh, as, as, as difficult and as impossible as things are right now, there is always hope. And... Um, uh, I'll, I'll admit I've been personally shaken and 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 anxious and fearful about uh, a lot of things. But 2020 has gone. We're now in 2021. 21. And then 2022 is going to come. And then 2023 is going to come. So after each year, we, we learn a little bit more. Yeah. We learn a little bit more. And the reason why I say there's hope is that in, 20, in 20, no, 1918, you had the Spanish flu. You know, you, you, that, that, that was a pandemic. Yes. Do you know what, what's the amazing thing about that pandemic then? Mm -hmm. Is that you and I are still alive. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happened then. But we moved, but, but, but humanity moved. Yeah. Um, and the strength of the human race to overcome the insurmountable is just absolutely incredible. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's going to get better. Yes. Um, but I do go to bed anxious sometimes. Um, yeah, that's being human. <laughs> yes, it's being human. Yes. But it's going to get better. Thank and you. I think at the end we're going to come out better for it. Yes. We would have learned a lot in this time. That's true. The one thing is don't let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Learn from it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're learning a lot. Yes, mm -hmm. we are. We are. Everyone is learning a lot. You can't say that I didn't learn anything. You're learning every day. Even how to make it work. Some people were like, I, they didn't think that they will survive. But as you said, that we survived 2020 and we are in a new year. And yes. we are living and we are 
you know, problems we are solving them yes, every day of our lives. So thank you so much, Grant, for your time. It's an absolute pleasure. Awesome. I want to also say a big thank you to our listeners today here on Agape FM. This is me, Dito Luzuko, and we do this thing from Monday till Saturday from 1 p.m. Thank you for tuning in, and I'm sure you learned something. Uh, you also want to tell you that whatever you're facing, you will defeat it. There will be solutions that will come to play. You won't even know how to even think of this, but you're going to do it. You're going to survive. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're still going to be together until 4 p.m., but this is the time that... We have with Grant here on Agape FM. Thank you so much. Uh, here is a